Hi guys, Dr. Betts here. Welcome back to Chemistry 1032 Instructional Videos. Um, now we're going to be going over 10.3 primary structure. Now, the primary structure of a protein is essentially the order of which the amino acids uh, take place in the polypeptide or protein. It's the order. Now, it always starts at the end terminus and ends at the C terminus. It's always written that way. Essentially, this amino acid's here, this amino acid's here, this amino acid's here, this amino acid's here, this one's here, this one's here, this one's here. It just tells you who follows who in the sequence. It doesn't give you any real overall three-dimensional structure. It just tells you who's following who. It's called the primary structure, sometimes referred to as the primary sequence. Okay? Secondary structure now is a little bit more confusing. Secondary structure is caused by hydrogen bonding of the amide bonds. Hydrogen bonding of the amide bonds. Now, it happens between the carbonyl and the NH of the peptide bonds. It happens between the carbonyl and the NH of the peptide bonds. So, here in this drawing right here, here's a carbonyl of one amino acid peptide bond. And here's the NH of another. And they're interacting through space. They're hydrogen bonding together. Okay? Now remember, hydrogen bonding is just an attractive force. It's not a bond. It's not a covalent bond. It's an attractive force. Okay? So this hydrogen here is attracting that oxygen from the carbonyl. They're going to come together. And when they do that, they're going to form a curl. Now, if you want to think about a, a real-life alpha helix, uh, remember... The old school telephones that had the, the the cord that was curled and you could stretch it out and it would come back. You could stretch it out. You know, if you want to talk to your friends, you'd run, run with the phone to another room. The cord would be stretched across the living room or whatever. Um, that's an alpha helix, or that's very similar to an alpha helix. So that's kind of what they look like. Now, remember, secondary structure is the amide bonds. And one example of this is called the alpha helix. So this is a secondary structure. It's a secondary structure. More specifically, it's an alpha helix. Sorry, that's really messy, guys. I'm not even going to write it there. I'm going to just get rid of it. This is a secondary structure. More specifically, it's an alpha helix. Secondary structure, alpha helix. Secondary structure, is caused by is caused by hydrogen bonding of the peptide bonds. Another secondary structure you have to know is called beta pleated sheet. And here's an example of it he, right over here. It's a little tougher to see, but again, here's the polypeptide turning here. Here it is again turning. So the polypeptide's running this way, turning, running back this way, turning and running back the other way, okay? So the instead of curling around itself, it's kind of um, turning, uh, it's kind of turning back onto itself like as a, I'm not even sure how to describe it. It's, it's, it literally looks like, a, sh like a, a folded piece of paper, like an accordion type thing. But again, it's hydrogen bonding of the peptide bonds. The peptide bonds are causing this, okay? So alpha helix, beta pleated sheet are the two secondary structures you have to know. Tertiary structure. Now, tertiary structure is caused by the R groups. It's caused by the R groups. All right? Now, basically, you'll have the nonpolar R groups. You'll have polar R groups, of course. And what the polar, or sorry, the nonpolar R groups will do is they'll interact with themselves. They don't like water. They're hydrophobic, so they'll stay away from it. They'll interact with each other, typically by folding in to the inside of the protein to the exclusion of water. They basically push water out so they can hang out with each other. All right? They turn away from the aqueous environment. They, they, they just ignore it. Like it's not even there. Now, polar side chains are the opposite. They'll turn towards the aqueous surroundings. They'll say, hey, how's it going? I'm a polar protein. How are you? You know? And they'll interact with it because they love water. They can, they can be attracted to it. Now, don't forget, tertiary structure, 
is attractive forces between the side chains or the R groups. Or the R groups. That's what's causing tertiary. Primary structure is a sequence. Secondary structure, alpha helix, beta pleated sheet, hydrogen bonding of the amide groups. Tertiary structure, the R groups cause it. Okay? And here's just a little... Uh, picture of it. You can take a look at it if you want. It names kind of all the different interactions that you have to know. There's also a table of them. Salt bridging, hydrogen bonding, disulfide bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and hydrophilic interactions. Okay? Oh, and here's a hydrogen bond. So here's numerous different types of tertiary structure in our group interacting. Okay? Uh, just so you guys know, this structure here is a protein ribbon structure. Basically what it does is it takes out all the structural detail and just leaves you with the overall tertiary structure. Uh, every now and then, like they did in this drawing, they'll throw in some atoms and some groups to, sh to uh, show you something. But normally it's just written as the ribbon. Just Everything's gone, just the ribbon structure showing you the overall structure. It's a very common way of looking at peptides and proteins. All right. Here are the interactions you have to know. So you might want to write these down. Maybe pause the video if I'm going too fast. Nonpolar interactions. If your R group is nonpolar, it will do what's called R group interactions. The side chains are repelled by water and they'll fold to the inside of the protein to interact with each other. Similar but not the same. Well, I guess it is kind of the same as a micelle would do. Okay? Polar interactions. Now, polar interactions take into account dipole-dipole, uh, ion-dipole, hydrogen bonding. Okay, So they're all kind of included in that. These are what give you the polar interactions. Now polar, interact polar side chains can interact, interact with other polar side chains or with the water and the environment. They can do either one. Okay, Salt bridges, also called ionic interactions. That's when you have acidic and basic amino acids. When you have acidic and basic amino acids, then you can have a salt bridge. Because remember, the acid will react with the base to give you a conjugate base, conjugate acid. Conjugate bases are usually negative. Conjugate acids are usually positive. And they'll be attracted via an ionic interaction. Pretty neat, huh? Now here's the one you might want to think about a little bit. Disulfide interactions or disulfide bonding. This is covalent. This is the only covalent interaction. The other interactions are all attractions. But the disulfide bond is literally a covalent bond. It's very strong. It's a very strong bond. Okay? Tertiary structure. Tertiary structure occurs when... Oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself there. Uh, there's two types of tertiary structures you have to know. Pretty simple. Globular proteins and fibrous proteins. Now, globular proteins tend to be soluble in water. They tend to have a water solubility and they tend to do things that are required in solution. Fibrous proteins, on the other hand, tend to be insoluble in water. And they tend to be things like your hair. Stuff like that. Or your fingernails. These are fibrous proteins. They're also uh, things like... Um, tendons and ligaments and stuff like that, they're more fibrous, so they're insoluble in water, okay? So globular proteins are small, spherical, tend to be soluble in water. Fibrous proteins are long, they're thread-like, they look like fibers, literally look like fibers. And uh, they um, usually are non are nonpolar on the outside, and they are, excuse me, and they are insoluble in water, so like your hair. It's good to have some proteins that don't dissolve in water, right? Because, you know, we, we need them. Quaternary structure. Quaternary structure occurs when two or more polypeptide chains find each other in solution somewhere and make a single biologically active protein. Now, these quaternary structures are held together by the R groups, the same thing that makes tertiary structure. Quaternary structure is held together by the R groups. Okay? Now, not every biologically active protein has a quaternary structure. Most of them just stop at tertiary, but there are some that have quaternary structures, and it's not that uncommon. Okay? 
And here's just a little picture of all the different types of structures. Here's primary, just a sequence. Secondary is when the amide bonds, hydrogen bond together, forming alpha helix, beta pleated sheet. Tertiary structure, that's when the R groups start to interact. You have hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions, salt bridges, and disulfide bonds. Okay? And here's quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is the, is the what happens when two or more polypeptides find each other, use their R groups to interact to make one biologically important protein. And that was 10.3. Now, kind of went through that a little fast because it's, I, you know, I don't want my video to be too long, but if you didn't catch all that, make sure you go back and watch it again. Some critical information there. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure. What causes them? Uh, name a few. For example, alpha helix beta pleated sheet. Two types of, uh, uh, excuse me, two types of, um, pri <laughs> I'm stumbling over my words here, two types of secondary structure. Uh, for tertiary structure, there was globular proteins and fibrous proteins. You might want to remember what those are. These are some very important details that you're going to want to know, okay? So we're going to leave it at that. We're going to come back in 10.4 and discuss denaturing proteins. But now I want to wish you guys good luck and good chemistry.